Hi, and welcome back to Ruck the JVM's Scala at Lightspeed. I'm Daniel, and in this video, we will talk about the fundamentals of the Scala language, and we will start writing our first Scala code. So this is our project that we created in the previous video. So if you want to write code alongside me, and if you haven't watched the previous video where we set up the initial files for this mini course, go ahead and watch that first and then come back to this video. I'm going to start writing our first Scala application and I'm going to go through the Scala fundamentals in this video. So under the com.rock.jvm package, I'm gonna right click and I'm going to create a new Scala application. So right click new, I'm gonna create a Scala class. I'm gonna name this basics and I'm going to select an object over here. I'm going to describe what an object is in the next video where we will discuss about Scala as an object oriented language but for now just create an object and make it extends app. Now, extending app means that whatever I write in between these curly braces will be executable as a standalone application. So if I right click, I will have this option to run the basics application. For now, the basics application doesn't actually do anything unless I write some actual code. So let me collapse this menu and start defining my first value. In Scala, we work with values. So the very first thing that I'm going to show you is how to define a value. So I'm gonna define a val called, let's call this meaning of life. And I'm going to make it an int and the value is obviously 42. So this is the structure of defining a value in Scala. The keyword val, the name of the value, then colon type, in this case an int, and then equals and the right hand side, which is the value of the value. Now, if you want to relate to other programming languages like Java or C++ or JavaScript, you can think of a value as a constant. So let me write some equivalent Java or C code. Const int meaning of life equals 42. So this is the equivalent definition of a value in Scala. It's a constant meaning that it cannot be reassigned. So reassigning is bad. So if I write meaning of life equals somehow 43, then the compiler will issue an error saying reassignment to val. Reassigning to a val is illegal. So we think in terms of these constants and in Scala we compose these values to obtain new values. Now one thing related to the type over here, so I mentioned the type is colon int. Now in Scala you don't always need to specify the type because the compiler is smart enough to infer that for you. So let me define a boolean as false. Notice I haven't specified the type and I don't need to because the compiler can look at the right hand side, mention that is a boolean and thus will attach the type to this boolean value. So notice that a boolean is a boolean because the compiler has figured it out. So the type mentioning is optional. That is most of the time and I'm going to show you some exceptions later in this video. Some of the regular types that you are going to use in day to day are int boolean car, double, float, and so on and so forth. So the regular types that you see in other languages with the first letter capitalized is what you are going to see in Scala as standard types, plus the string type, which is pretty special and common to JVM languages like Java and Scala. So let me define a string as the string I love Scala, which I hope you do by the end of this series. So we define a string by this double quote string. Now, Strings in Scala can be composed, as in other languages, with a plus operator. So let me create a composed string as i plus a space plus love or live plus another space plus Scala. So the strings can be composed with the plus operator and that means concatenating a string. But something that's very specific to Scala is what is called interpolation. So let me define an interpolated string and I'm going to say s quote, and when you say s quote, you can inject another value inside the string. So I can say the meaning of life is, and then with a dollar sign, I can inject another value inside the string. This is very useful day to day when you compose strings. So these are strings and string operations. Awesome, so we've discussed defining values, standard types, strings, and string operations. 
Now something that's very important to Scala as a language and to the style of thinking that you will need to apply when using the Scala language is to think in terms of values and expressions. So when you define a value, the right hand sign can be any expression you like. So let me define expressions. So if I define an expression as 2 plus 3, 2 plus 3 is an expression because it can be reduced to a value. So expressions are structures that can be reduced to a value. Now, why is that important? Well, in most other languages and in most common languages like JavaScript or C++ or Java or Python, we think in terms of instructions, which are the things that the computer does sequentially. So we tell the computer, do this, do that, increment this value, do this 10 more times, and as long as this Boolean is false, do this. In Scala, we don't think in terms of instructions. We think in terms of values and composing these values to obtain new values. Now, in Scala, everything is an expression that can be reduced to a value. Even the if statement is an expression. That is called an if expression. So let me define an if expression as if the meaning of life is bigger than 43, then 56, else 999. So this is an if expression. It's an expression because it reduces to a single value, either 56 or 999, depending on the value of the meaning of life. To relate to other languages like JavaScript or C++, there is this ternary question mark operator. So in other languages, you would say meaning of life greater than 43 question mark 56 colon 999. But in Scala, the if statement is much easier to read. That is because you can chain if expressions as long as you want. So let's call this chained if expression is if meaning of life is bigger than 43, then 56. Else, so I can write this on another line, else if meaning of life is less than zero, then negative two. Else if meaning of life is bigger than 999, then you can return some other value, else just return zero. So you can chain this if expression into a composed expression, which is still a single expression because it can reduce to a single value, either 56 or negative two or 78 or zero. So notice that right off the bat, we're starting to think in a different way because we're not doing something depending on some conditions. We're rather assigning values to these names if some conditions are true or not. All right. Now, I mentioned that everything in Scala is an expression, and one of the notable expressions in Scala are code blocks. So let me define a code block. And a code block is defined by opening and closing a curly brace. And inside this code block, you can add definitions. That is, let's call this a local value. And let me define the value 67. And you can define as many things as you want. You can define local values, you can define functions, classes, whatever you want, even inner code blocks. But at the end, you will have to return something. So I could return a local value plus three. A local value plus three is the last expression of the code block and thus it will be the value of the entire block. So the last expression of the code block is the value of the entire block. Now, if you pause a second to think about it, I haven't mentioned the type here for a code block, but the compiler is smart enough to go through this code block, figure out that this last expression is an int plus an int, and thus it will assign the int type to this code block as you can see in this little pop-up over here. So the compiler is very, very smart. It figures out the types for you so that you don't have to specifically focus on every single possible type, especially if the types are really, really complex in really large code bases. Now, another fundamental thing about Scala is defining functions. So we work with values and functions because Scala is a functional programming language. So let me define a function. Defining a function is done with the keyword def, you name this function, let's call this my function. And inside parentheses, you would pass in arguments in the form name colon type, separated by a comma. And then at the very end, you would specify the return type, let's say 
a string in this case, and then you put an equal sign, much like you do with values, and here on the right hand side you have a single expression. So you would say y plus a space plus x, for example. So this single expression is the returned value of this function. Now you can define a function as simple as this one on a single line, or you can use a code block for larger functions, which is really the case with large code bases. So I can open and close some curly brace, and this definition will be equally fine, because as I mentioned a couple of seconds ago, a code block is also an expression. Now functions can be really complex and they can depend on their own definition, which means that functions are usually recursive in practice. So let me define a factorial function, which takes the number n as an argument, so n colon int, and it will return an int which will be the product of all the natural numbers from 1 up to n. So this function can be interpreted as follows. If n is less than or equal to 1, then I will return 1. Else, I will return n times factorial of n minus 1. Now this style of thinking is a little bit different than what you've probably been used to from Java or C++ or Python. So how does this function work? Let's say I want to compute factorial of 5. So factorial of 5, because 5 is not less than or equal to 1, that's 5 times factorial of 4. Well, what is factorial of 4? Well, 4 is not less than or equal to 1, so factorial of 4 is 4 times factorial of 3. Again, factorial of 3, in much the same way, is 3 times factorial of 2, and factorial of 2 is 2 times factorial of 1, and this time factorial of 1 is equal to 1. That is because 1 is less than or equal to 1. So factorial of 1 is equal to 1. So if I wanted to compute factorial of 5, I would need to go back on my stack and compute factorial of 2, which is 2 times factorial of 1, which is 2 times 1. Then we would need to compute factorial of 3, which is 3 times factorial of 2, which is 3 times 2. Factorial of 4 is 4 times factorial of 3, which is 4 times 6. And factorial of 5 is 5 times factorial of 4, which is 5 times 24. And this is 120. So this is how we think in Scala, in terms of recursive functions to compute the values that you want. If you want to take an idea out of this video is the following. In Scala, we don't use loops or iteration. We use recursion. So this is the fundamental thinking style that you will need to adopt in order to be a Scala programmer. Scala also has variables and loops, but they're heavily, heavily discouraged. If you write variables or loops in production code, you will be shunned upon, fired, and nobody will speak to you again. That was a joke, but that was only half a joke. Iteration is heavily discouraged in Scala. So if you ever need to ask, how do I iterate? How do I loop in Scala? That is the wrong question. You will need to think in terms of functions and recursion. Now, the last thing that I'm going to show you in this video is the unit return types. So notice that every single thing that we wrote in this code was somehow related to a value. Everything was an int, a boolean, a string. All these functions that we wrote were either a string, an int, so everything returned a meaningful value. In Scala, there is such a thing as no meaningful value. And this is the unit return type. And no meaningful value is the equivalent of void in other languages. So for example, the print line function that is a function that's returning void or unit. So if I print line, I love Scala, this doesn't return any meaningful value. It just does something. And we think of the unit type as the type of side effects, which is a very important term in Scala and functional programming because side effects are operations that have nothing to do with computing some meaningful information. Side effects relate to printing something on screen, showing something on screen, sending something to a socket or a server, uh, storing something in a file or something like that, but it has, has nothing to do with computing meaningful information. So side effects return unit. Every print statement, which is the equivalent of system.out.println, 
printf in C or C++, print in Python and console log. All of these are equivalent functions that return void in other languages. And in Scala, they return unit. If you want to define a function returning unit, you would simply say my unit returning function, which takes no arguments or it takes some arguments that you like and returns unit. And here you can return anything you like. For example, print line, I love, I don't love actually, I don't love <laughs> returning unit. But notice even these side effects that have no meaningful information to return still return a value of type unit. And the only value that this unit type contains, so val the unit, is this little token, open and close parenthesis. And this open and close parenthesis is the same value returned by print line and other functions returning unit. All right, so that was it with the Scala fundamentals. In the next video, I'm going to talk about Scala as an object-oriented language. If you liked this video and found it useful, go ahead and click the like button and subscribe to the Rock the JVM channel, and I'll be posting more free goodies here. This video series is also available as a free online course at rockthegvm.com, where you will also have the option to download these videos for your offline use. And on the Rock the JVM site, we also have hundreds of hours of premium content dedicated to Scala, functional programming, Aka, Apache Spark, and so much more. So go ahead and check out rockthegvm.com, and I'll be waiting for you in the next video.